Hey there, Mr. Reddit here. Welcome back to another episode of r slash Entitled Parent Stories. Our first story we'll be reading today. Karen Mother Insults the Way I Raise My Own Kids. After that, Cut My Salary in Half? Kiss Your Business Goodbye. And after that, Make Me Do All the Science Project? I'll throw you under the bus. Now for every thumbs up this video gets, one Karen steps on a Lego. Oh, you're just wrong for that. So please smash that like button. And if you're new, subscribe and turn on notifications for new stories from Reddit every single day. Karen Mother Insults the Way I Raise My Own Kids I, 23, female, have two kids, a daughter who's five and a son who's three. My style of parenting is not the most popular. One main thing of mine is I do not punish my kids. I ignore bad behavior and I reward good behavior. Or if they're doing something wrong, I simply redirect them. It works amazing for me and my kids and they're both very well adjusted and behaved. Something else I do is give them full control over their own bodies. They decide how they want their hair and what clothes they wear. My daughter has a shaved head and she's honestly rocking it. My parents, specifically my mother, hate this. My sister had a wedding and asked them to wear formal clothes. My daughter wore a suit and my son wore a dress, which upset pretty much everyone. My sister was thankfully okay with it and said while she'd have appreciated my daughter in a dress to be a bridesmaid, she understood it was her decision to make, not ours. She didn't mind my son because he was flower boy and she said him wearing a dress fit the aesthetic better, so a win all round. Anyway, my mother is getting increasingly upset. She gets upset when she wants a hug and they say no and I don't force them to hug her. She continues to buy my daughter feminine clothes that get promptly donated to charity and insists on buying my son boys toys, which he never uses. This has become a huge problem. She's upset because she thinks my kids don't like her and I explained they'd like her more if she just left them alone. They can talk, they have opinions, ask them how they're feeling and work with that. Recently, this has progressed into her calling me a neglectful mother. Apparently, they'll never learn boundaries, which makes me laugh because she's the one who doesn't understand boundaries, but I digress. Apparently, they'll never grow up and will be bullied in school and become snowflakes. She also claims they'll become badly behaved once they grow up. I think she's being a jerk for trying to change the way that I parent and she thinks I'm driving a force between my kids and her. Am I the jerk? Edit. Since I've posted this, I've gotten many, many comments. I apologize for not being able to reply to them all. Every comment I've received can be placed into these categories. Someone who was neglected, praising me and saying I'm what they wished they had slash asking me to adopt them, which honestly warms my heart. You all deserved so much better and I would adopt you if I could. Someone asking for parenting advice, which I'm more than happy to help out with. My number one tip is just go with your gut. Be the parent you wished you had. Mistakes are okay. Apologize and move on. And finally, people who are telling me I'm creating monsters and I should burn for all of eternity. Which is valid, I guess. My parenting works for me. If it needs adjusting for them in the future, then I will adjust it. But my children are good kids. They aren't evil. They understand boundaries and behave more than your average kid. So I'm really not worried about them in the real world. They'll be fine. And of course, I've had the odd bits of advice, which I also really appreciate. I've been informed the way I discipline my kids isn't ignoring them, it's just a lesser known way. Negative punishment, positive rewards. I explained their bad behavior to my kids and why it wasn't good. And it's worked perfectly so far. If it needs adjusting in the future, I will do so. And I've had quite a few professionals tell me this is the preferred method of discipline, so I'm sticking with it for now. As for the wedding incident, I discussed everything with my sister and we bought my daughter's suit slash son's dress two months before the wedding. At first, she didn't like that my daughter wouldn't be wearing a dress, but I explained some personal things to her that I will not be putting on the internet, and we came to an agreement. She still was a little upset, but said she'd rather have my daughter in the bridesmaid photos in a suit than not in them at all. By the time the wedding actually happened, she seemed very happy with it and wasn't as upset as beforehand. I think she just needed time to adjust, and she asked my son to be in a dress. I was going to put him in a suit because tiny suits are adorable, but she specifically asked and he was very happy to wear a princess dress. Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk or is grandma? Please let us know. I can't wait to read what our listeners have to say about this one. Cut my salary in half? Kiss your business goodbye. The cast. Names changed for anonymity. Me, your storyteller at the moment. Chad, hiring CTO. Richard, CEO, brother of Chad. Big bro, engineer coworker, and Eddie, 
IT and desktop support guy. This takes place near the very beginning of my software engineering career, back in 05 or 06. I'd just been let go from my previous place of employment due to being compliant with directives I'd been given, although not maliciously, so that story wouldn't be appropriate here, sadly, and thus working myself out of a job. I was a young college dropout from a technical college that hadn't been federally accredited yet, and thus all my student loans were from banks and loan companies instead of from Uncle Sam and debts were due. I was also making payments on my very first car, even though it was a beater that the prior owners had already nearly driven into the ground, four years old and nearly 200,000 miles on it when I bought it, and of course, rent and utilities. The job I had just been let go from already had me working paycheck to paycheck as they paid far under average rate, but I was still new professional, so I couldn't be very choosy. I was living in Los Angeles County, so the cost of living was so bad, I was having to choose which bills were going to be late on a monthly basis. Specifically, I was living in a town called San Pedro, a small town tucked fairly out of the way. After blasting my resume to all the job boards, I get a call from a startup who seems interested in my resume and wants me to come in for a face-to-face -face interview, skipping the call screen entirely. In my desperation, I agree. I'm given an address, which is all the way up in Woodland Hills. I check the internet, 55 minute drive so long as there's no traffic. With traffic, it looks like the commute will be more like an hour and 45 minutes each way. I'm desperate though, and literally nobody else has reached out to me about my resume or responded to my applications, so I go to the interview. I arrive to a mostly empty office complex, maybe six or seven other cars in a parking lot capable of holding at least 50. I go into the building mentioned and the address and call the phone number I was given to let them know I've arrived. Enter Chad. Chad comes to meet me and seems excited that I've come. He escorts me through the building to an office. Mind you, as far as I can see, we're the only two humans in the building. He gives me the pitch for the company, tells me he built the software being sold, but it's not scalable and he needs someone who can rewrite it. After we go through the whole interview song and dance, he offers me the job on the spot. The pay is marginally higher than the last gig, so I figure gas would be covered for the commute. I agree and we shake hands as I'm going to be starting the next Monday. Red flags start appearing from the very first minute I arrive on Monday. First, I'm given a tour, which consists of the 14 by 14 foot office I'm going to be sharing with Chad, as well as another engineer who's going to be starting the following Monday. I'm not a fan of having someone able to look over my shoulder. It makes me nervous. I ask why each engineer's desk has two computers. Because the one you will be writing code on doesn't have internet access for security purposes. Note, this was pure paranoia. There was nothing about this software that required such tight security. We weren't doing any government contracts or anything of the sort. Then I'm escorted clear across the building to meet with the CEO, Richard, and the IT guy, Eddie, and the sales support team. I'm told that half of the team is supporting the existing version of the application, two people are selling the existing version to new clients, or trying to, and one person is explicitly tasked with selling the new version, the one I haven't even started on yet. I'm still young and dumb at this point, but even I know this means the salesperson is probably giving out a date when the customers should expect their purchase to be filled. It's a good thing you started when you did. We've been telling customers it'll be ready in June. Did I mention all this was happening in February? Apparently, I've agreed to rewrite, test, and package an entire application I've never seen before in approximately four months. So, two are being done, I sit down and get to work. After jumping through a bunch of hoops of getting the software I prefer downloaded onto the actual work machine, as well as the code, I set about reviewing code so horrific I've not seen its like since, and there isn't a single comment in the entire thing. Before I can ask a single question of the CTO, however, he tells me he's headed to downtown LA to scalp his tickets to the Lakers game, and that he'll see me tomorrow. So, now I'm alone in the office with this abomination, a machine that's been hamstrung to heck and back, and the only thing I've got to console me is the fact that at least I'm employed again. Fast forward a week, I've documented the bulk of the code because there wasn't any, and the boss and I do not get along. He's mad because I've not written any substantial code, and I'm frustrated because I'm trying to understand a lot of what specific code is trying to do, and he's routinely leaving around noon to go sell his tickets for Lakers games, or just not in the office because he's chatting with someone else. When he is in the office, I show him my documentation and try to get him to verify it or describe the purpose of code where all I can say is, what? By the end of the week, I've covered about 30% of the project in a wiki-like document. 
and I've taken to leaving after sunset so I can A. Get more done, B. Have a shorter commute, and C. Drive when my car isn't an oven. The AC didn't work. I've barely managed to convince the CTO that what I'm doing is necessary, so the engineer starting the next Monday doesn't have to do anywhere near the same crap I've got, which would make us a more efficient team. Monday arrives and in comes Big Bro. I call him this because he was a much more experienced engineer than I was. We spend the first day with him getting set up, then us reviewing what I've documented. He manages to answer some questions the CTO never did, just because he is that much better, and I start to feel more confident. Over the next weeks, Big Bro took me under his wing as an engineer, teaching me best practices, standards, and where my plans were good and where they could be better. If it hadn't been for him, I'd have gone insane. I end up joining him outside for smoke breaks even though I don't smoke, just so I can get a breath of non-office air. He and I discuss the project and we also make friends with Eddie, who makes us laugh by telling us horror stories about the CTO and CEO. Apparently, he was a school friend of theirs and basically worked with them because they paid him to do something he felt was super easy. April rolls around. I've got a special occasion I need the day off for, which happens to be a Wednesday that year. I had advised him when I first started and he had been cool with it. I remind him on April 2nd, since I had an irrational fear of policy decisions being made on April Fool's Day, and he loses it. He goes off on a rant and straight up informs me that he regrets hiring me, claiming I didn't have the skills I told him I did and wasn't worth what I was being paid. We're definitely not halfway done, more like one third, and it's already been decided that June is a lost cause and that we're shooting for August now. That habit I started before of leaving after the sun went down? Yeah, that never stopped. I was arriving at 9 a.m. every day and leaving around 10 p.m. every night, trying my best. Big Bro was the same and Eddie would stay late with us just because we liked hanging out together. So it should be understandable that I was very close to losing it right back at him. In a strained yet diplomatic voice, I told him that if he put in the same amount of work to help us as we put in to rewrite his code, we'd probably be a lot closer to done than we are, especially given the 12 hour days. He was not a fan of that and switched to straight up yelling, blaming us for the lost sales and refunds due to the delays and that the only way he'd get off of our backs was by getting the project done. This entire time, Big Bro is just sitting there and says nothing to back me up. Chad then left the office for a bit, and I just declared I was taking my lunch and would be back in an hour. I felt frustrated by Chad and betrayed by Big Bro, who I felt, rightly or not, should have had my back since we were in the same boat. When we were both back in the office, he apologized for yelling and told me that since he agreed when I was hired, I could have my day off. Cool. I apologized too, although not for anything specific. I just didn't want to talk to him anymore and figured that was the fastest way to end the conversation. Fast forward to June and the opportunity for malicious compliance. Over the last two months, Chad has been getting worse and worse. He's yelling nearly every day and still leaving early too. Big Bro and Eddie are also feeling the pain. Nobody is safe from his ego. The smoke breaks in afternoon slash evening portion of our day are when we're most productive as nobody can focus until Chad leaves. The first Monday in June rolls around and Chad invites me to go on a walk outside for a one-on-one -on -one meeting. I figured I'm being fired. At this point, we've had to refactor the rewrite almost entirely due to missing a critical chunk of functionality and we're still only 60% done. August release is looking less and less sure. Chad informs me that he's hired a third engineer, but in order to stay in the budget to pay me, he's cutting my salary in half. I stop on the spot and just give him a blank look. Are you serious? I ask. I'm barely able to pay for my bills and the gas required to commute here as it is. If you cut my salary at all, I won't be able to afford to live. At this point, the idea of cutting my productivity to help ramp up a new engineer so he can help us meet the deadlines doesn't even occur to me. Although in hindsight, that would also have been a pretty major issue. Chad brushes me off. That's not my problem. The fact that you missed one deadline and look like you're going to miss another is. If you've got a problem with that, you're more than welcome to go find another job. The new guy starts in two weeks. And with that, he walked inside. I had just been told that I had two weeks left of job at my current salary. Cool. So that day I do something I hadn't done since I first started. I left while the sun was still up. Specifically, I left at 5 p.m. I drive my oven car no working air conditioning in a car that had been left in the sun all day in Woodland Hills had me feeling like a baked potato. Through traffic, hour and a half commute home through LA heat, 
and updated my resume before reactivating my accounts on all the job sites. I'm contacted the next day by a potential new employer and I get an interview scheduled. I decide to tell Big Bro about the new opportunity and he hits me with news that lets me know just how small a world we live in. Me. Hey, Big Bro, just for your information, I've started looking for a new job. I've already got an interview lined up. Big Bro. Really? Where? Me. Over at this company. Big Bro. Wow, that's where I worked before I came here. That place is pretty awesome and I left there on pretty good terms. I know the CTO there. Go ahead and use me as a reference. Me. Skeptical. Really? Okay. Turns out Big Bro was true to his word and the CTO and I even talked about Big Bro during the interview. Apparently, they had already talked about me and Big Bro had been the ultimate hype man, confirming everything I said was why I was looking for a new job and everything. All goes well and I'm electronically signing an offer letter that Friday afternoon. Chad had already left for the day, so there was nobody to look over my shoulder as I used the work computer that had internet access to get this done. At the new job, the commute is cut by more than half and comes with a pretty significant raise. I tell Big Bro and Eddie on the last smoke break, I still don't smoke, that I'm done and I found something new. Oddly enough, they both smile and just wish me luck. No hard feelings, hope we can stay in touch. Odd, but I'd stopped really caring about anything related to that job, so I paid it no mind. I went back inside, packed up my stuff into my backpack and walked to the CEO's office. Me. Hey, Richard, got a minute? Richard. Hey, OP, what's up? Me. Just wanted to let you know I found a new job, so I'm moving on. Richard. Really? Why? We need you. Me. You guys decided it was cool to cut my salary to a point where I couldn't afford to live. Chad said if I didn't like it, I should look for something new. So I did. Richard, looking defeated. Well, when's your last day? Me. Today. Richard, now upset. We need you here to train the new guy who starts soon. Hey, I had to train myself and to an extent, Big Bro when he first started. The new guy should be able to as well. And with that, I left for greener pastures. The unexpectedly huge fallout. Four months later, Big Bro texts me to ask how things are going. I tell him things are great and we schedule a lunchtime call because apparently things have gone sideways in a huge way. Part 1. Apparently, Chad came in on Monday almost violently angry and demands Eddie re-image my work machine first thing in the morning, which erases everything I'd left on there. Big Bro comes in an hour late, and he and Chad discuss the new timeline for the project. Somewhere in there, apparently, Big Bro asks Chad to log into the admin account on my old work machine so he can pull the documents I'd accumulated about the planned architecture, the existing code, meeting notes, etc. Chad answers by apparently punching a hole in the wall and leaving for the day probably to go to the hospital to deal with his hand, at 10.30 in the morning. Big Bro then spends the rest of that week ostensibly working on recreating the documentation from scratch. Part 2. When I asked how the new guy handled the new documentation, Big Bro laughed and told me there never was any documentation. Apparently, he and Eddie had become really good friends in the months we worked there, to the point where they had become roommates about a month before I left. More than that though, they decided to start a freelance slash consulting business together and only had to decide on when to make that their full-time jobs. Neither of them liked Chad much and wanted to make their departure heard as much as possible. So they decide to make Big Bro's last day the day before the new guy starts and Eddie would quit shortly afterward, sticking around just long enough to watch the bomb go off. Did I mention Big Bro never told Chad he was quitting? Yeah, he just didn't show up that Monday. He had, however, emailed that documentation he had spent a week writing to Chad. Turns out he wasn't documenting the code at all. He had spent a week writing a letter explaining in excruciating detail why Chad was such a bad boss and he had emailed it to everyone in the company. I asked if he still had it so I could read it and he sent it to me after the call. Thankfully, like the big helper he was, Eddie had ensured that the new guy's email was set up and in the proper groups before the email was sent. So the guy's first email in the company was a novella about the kind of person he had agreed to work for. Apparently, Chad thought it was appropriate to take his frustration out on the new guy, who'd already read a significant portion of the email before Chad shoved him away from his desk and deleted it. Apparently, new guy promptly decided, and rightfully so, that agreeing to work for Chad had been a mistake, packed up his things, and quit on the spot. Part 3. With the new guy quitting, the August deadline was now little more than a dream within a dream, which according to Eddie doesn't stop Chad and Richard from trying to find that miracle rock star engineer who can save them from their own situation. 
which, given what they were offering as pay, didn't exist. So time advances in its unstoppable way. August arrives, and customers find that they've paid for something that hasn't been delivered yet, and pretty much unanimously demand refunds, with a few customers bringing legal action against them. With the amount they have to refund, and the money they now need for legal fees, because of the way they had incorporated, they were personally liable, they could no longer afford to pay anyone and were forced to shut their business. Have you ever had a boss demand impossible tasks from you? If so, what did you do about it? Please let us know. I'd probably just quit. Then again, I've never had a job. Make me do all of the science project? I'll throw you under the bus. Cast. We've got Pathological Liar. We've got Sheep Boy. We've got Amazing Teacher. And me, as starting to salve. So, this story happened when I was in 7th grade. During that time, the school district had all students participate in a mandatory annual science fair from elementary school up to the end of middle school. The idea was to get students interested in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math fields, and occupations. After participating in science fairs for six years, I was used to the usual rigmarole that a science fair project entailed. I come up with some, hopefully unique, project ideas, most likely the very original electricity from a potato project. I make a hypothesis, collect data, pay the school or Home Depot 10 to $20 for a science fair board, tape up charts and diagrams to the board the night before presenting, and then rinse and repeat for the next year. However, this year my class was doing things a little differently. My class had the honor of being the first to be selected to participate in a virtual science fair. So basically, we were voluntold. No one in our section of the district at the time did a virtual science fair before, so we were signed up as guinea pigs to test it out. If that wasn't good enough, my class also had to promote healthy collaboration among students, so we were assigned to do projects in a group. Now, I hate group work. I always got the short end of the stick in a group. Either my group gets stuck with someone that skimps out on work and the other group members and I have to cover their portion, or everyone in the group except me avoids work like the plague and no matter how much I urge them to participate, I eventually have to do all the work myself to maintain my precious grade. I was a straight A student at the time, so any group work assigned to me was a threat to my grade and my sanity. If I ever got less than an A on any assignment, my mother would ask me, why didn't you get an A? Sonny boy, do you need help at school? It drove me insane since I wasn't failing. Anyways, the online science fair was pretty simple. As a group, we were assigned access to a group science fair board that we could fill out with our results, figures, hypothesis, etc. We were to have certain parts of the project, like the discussion done, by particular dates to get points towards our grade. The overall project was due in two months, and then we were to give a presentation. Amazing teacher was brilliant. She wanted us to record our project progress in a composition book in tandem with the online portion, which she would review during our presentation in two months. I believe this was to help us keep track of notes in case we forgot to log them into the computer later, but it was used by me as a tool in my revenge. I was paired with Pathological Liar and Sheep Boy, who I was kind of friends with. We brainstormed and settled on testing the performance of an individual in exercise before and after they drink an energy drink. This was in part influenced by Monster Energy Drink just becoming popular and Sheep Boy's parents getting a new home gym. I thought it was great since I was playing football at the time and wanted to work out more. Also, Pathological Liar, Sheep Boy and I literally shared every class together and lived within a mile of each other so it would be super easy to communicate. However, Sheep Boy and Pathological Liar never seemed to want to talk about the project. After two weeks of radio silence from Liar and Sheep Boy, I finally corralled them in one place and suggested we meet up at Sheep Boy's house that weekend to start the project. On the day of the meetup, Sheep Boy's mom had to go grocery shopping or something, so Sheep Boy was out. Undaunted, I told Pathological Liar it would be fine if we work at my house and researched other studies on it to get the ball rolling. But Liar never showed up that day, so I decided to confront him on our walk home from school the next day. Oh my god, if you heard what came out of this boy's mouth as an excuse. While we were literally within spitting distance of my house, Liar said he couldn't come over yesterday or today because his grandparents had got into a plane crash. I was flabbergasted and exclaimed, what, really? But I didn't see anything on the news about a plane crash. Pathological Liar responded indignantly, Plane crashes happen all the time, starting to salve. They're not all going to get reported on. Their plane struck another plane on the tarmac and then rolled over and snapped off both wings. Me, insert surprised Pikachu face. 
OMG, I'm so sorry. Did they get hurt? Liar. What? No, why would they, idiot? Anyways, I can't do the project this week. See ya. This little jerk then ran home. After I got home and deduced that he had just fed me a sack of lies, I just said whatever and filled out the preliminary sections of the project and wrote notes in the composition book to at least ensure we had something to turn in next week. I was willing to give the group a second chance because maybe their busy middle school lives were swamped. After another two weeks of attempting to coordinate my group and getting them to at least contribute a page or two to the report, we finally decided to meet up at Sheep Boy's house again to start collecting the data. We actually all showed up this time and Sheep Boy's mom had bought the monster energy drinks we needed. Pathological Liar started to guzzle them because he wanted to test out the drinks first. Sheep Boy showed off his new home gym and then got us to play Smash Brothers for half an hour. I didn't want to play at first, but then decided to lighten up and we could do the tests afterward. After coaxing my group back to the gym, Pathological Liar just rambled and chit-chatted. Me, trying to be pragmatic, said, Hey guys, why don't we start our exercise now and record some data, and then afterward I can school y'all in Smash Brothers. Sheep Boy looked willing until Liar sighed out. Oh my god, starting to sob. <sighs> we didn't invite you out to do this stupid project, we invited you to hang out. Sheep Boy's attitude did a complete 180, chiming in, Yeah, we don't want to do the stupid project now. I was seething. Pathological Liar spouted a load of bull. This wasn't even his house. I was the one who organized this get-together to collect science data for the fair. I was the one herding these sheeple around. OMG. The second chance I gave them was taken and then stomped all over the ground and they weren't getting a third one. I relented and said, Okay then, let's just hang out then. When I got home that night, I was angry, and I used that anger to fuel my revenge. I conscripted my parents to the science fair project, and they helped me collect the data I needed by volunteering to work out and drink energy drinks. The data collection problem was solved. Once I got enough data, I wrote down everything for the science fair project in the composition book. I even uploaded everything to the online science fair board. I created all the PowerPoint slides and scripts for the presentation. Over the next few weeks leading up to the presentation, Sheep Boy and Liar didn't even ask about the science fair project. They had no intention of doing any of the work. Although my anger fueled me to get the project done, I wasn't finished. I did the pettiest thing I could think of and signed a corner of the composition book with, Starting to Sav did all the work. I knew that Amazing Teacher would be checking our composition books while we were presenting the project and I couldn't wait to see how Liar would try to weasel his way out of this one. On the day of the presentation, Liar and Sheep Boy were nervously fidgeting at their desks because they didn't have anything prepared. I strolled in and told them to relax since I made a PowerPoint. They relaxed, not knowing how stupid they were going to look while presenting. Oh, how dumb they looked when we started presenting to the whole class. I had already memorized the slides and my script and was effortlessly strolling around the room, making eye contact and delivering a great speech on the science fair project. Liar and Sheep Boy just read off the slides with deadpan expressions with their hands in their pants and not moving an inch. I was relishing this, all the while gleefully peeking at the back of the classroom where Amazing Teacher was reading through our composition book. Amazing Teacher would stop our presentation every once in a while to ask questions and compare with what was written down in the book. But once the bomb dropped, my blood ran cool with maniacal glee. I saw Awesome Teacher stop and read a corner of the book. She then read it out loud. Starting to salve did all of the work? I felt Pathological Liar and Sheep Boy grow cold next to me. Pathological Liar, that cunning fox, stammered out. Well, yeah, he worked on that section, miss. Amazing Teacher brought her glasses down to the tip of her nose and stared at Pathological Liar over the rims and coolly stated, So you're telling me that Starting to Sav was just signing his part of the composition book and that you all wrote in here equally? Liar. Yes, ma'am. Me, shrugs. At this point, I wavered. I didn't want to feel the social wrath from them or their friends for stepping out and challenging pathological liar's lie, so I stayed silent. At least I embarrassed them for a moment. After my crowning achievement of embarrassing liar and sheep boy, I thought nothing would really come from it, but boy was I wrong. After grades were released for the project, I was totally bummed out that I got a 96. It wasn't the perfect A that I was hoping for, and I knew my mother would be asking me, why didn't you get an A+, why didn't you get a 100? But then Sheep Boy and Pathological Liar ran up to me with their eyes wide with terror, asking, What did you get for your grade? Me. I got a grade. Why? 
This is how I snarkily avoided answering questions on my grade. Liar. Sheet Boy got a 66 and I got a 48. I was shocked to hear that and then I figured out that Amazing Teacher must have interrogated my group mates on the project separately and awarded them the grades they deserved. OMG, my petty revenge tanked their grades. The science fair project alone was 25% of our total grade that year. I was so grateful that Amazing Teacher saw my frustration and punished them. Did you like group projects in school or not? Please let us know. I could never stand them to be honest. You definitely haven't seen this video yet, so please come watch it next and we'll see you when you get there. And if you support our channel by joining as a member today, we'll give you a special shout out in our next video. And to have us make any kind of video you'd like us to, just come visit us on Fiverr. Link pinned in the comments below.